Ah, Chris yeah. Walker doing this. Yep, it's getting set up. There's Mark Nass. Quick sound Mark check. Mark and I are twins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. That's right. funny. I got the other ones upstairs. Right. All right, so this is a new concept for us. We've already got four attendees, and we usually do a green room before these things start, but we've decided to do it different because this is liquid wear unplugged, and uh, there's at least a handful of people already on, and as you note, we've, we're doing things different. We've got our cameras on, and uh, we'll let everyone introduce themselves on the liquid wear side here, and then we'll do that again later. Things will be real informal. You'll see. I'm Jason Smith. I usually use my middle initial because my name's so common. But I lead uh, product marketing and more technical than most marketing people usually. But I've got real techies to back me up today. Ray, you want to? So, yeah, I'm Ray Swanson. I'm director of marketing over at Liquidware. I'm kind of the man behind the curtain, but you can still see me today. So uh, I'm hopefully we'll get everyone uh, moving and help everybody out, even though I'm having a little bit of an issue right now in seeing our attendees. So we'll see how that uh, filters in as we move on. So go ahead, but if anybody else wants to introduce themselves, maybe Mark. Cool. Thanks, Ray. Hi, I'm Mark Naus, uh, Senior Director of Alliances and um, I'm both business and technical, uh, and I'm looking forward to chatting today. Should be fun. CW. Hold on, I'm having audio issues. <laughs> All right. Well, that's Chris Walker. He's joining us today. We'll do introductions again in a little bit. Again, it looks like a handful of people on right, Ray. Uh, I just chatted you on that. I'm having a little bit of a technical issue here, possibly. So. All right. Let's see if we can get that resolved. <laughs> There's Mr. Walker. I'm ready. Ah, that's great. Nice. Full, full Georgia over there. <laughs> yep. If you can type in those gloves without a typo, <laughs> I'd be very impressed. It'll be a little difficult here today. <laughs> Me, I can't type without gloves without a typo. So, you know. <laughs> Let me have a spell check. I reply to you, Ray. So how are things going in your neck of the woods, guys? Keeping busy. Good. Um, so we, yeah, we're 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 increasing. We're more people are joining us, and so just to recap, this is a soft start to this today's discussion, and we're going informal, liquid wear unplugged, and you'll hear me say that a few times if you're one of the first few handful of people on as as people join. But this is a different webinar concept. While we're uh, just bannering around like this on the liquid wear side, we would love to see some suggested questions over here in the chat window. What are you facing for work from home challenges? Not just personally and maybe personally, but also for your workforce. And you know, what are some of your VDI challenges or anything that we you would like to see us discuss today? And you'll see that uh, we do have a slide up that tells you about our community, our website, and where to go. But we're also on Twitter, and that'd be great if you gave us a shout out if you're, you know, on there this morning and you want to say you're on this new webinar with Liquidware Unplugged. We're going to discuss uh, and go any myriad of directions, as as you'll see. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll just have some uh, coffee talk or water talk. Yeah, we're actually not scheduled to begin for about another 10 minutes, so we just figured we'd open it live and uh, check in with everybody, see how everybody's doing today. Yep. 
and and off the bat, you know, I know that most of us are in this work from home reality that we have now. I will apologize 100%. My son has uh, viola lessons here coming up uh, in this time period that the session's going on. So we might get a little bit of music uh, from the background if, if that happens. So we'll see what what happens. It looks like oh, we've got a fam really familiar, is. familiar, some familiar audience members on this morning. And one of them yeah, had a request them. already. He's requesting the rest of Chris Walker, Chris Walker's <laughs> face be covered. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> Somebody you know. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Who's going to itch? Don't touch your face. So I am in uh, a town called Cumming, Georgia. It's close to Alpharetta this morning. And the weather here this morning, if anyone's curious, 66 degrees, and that means 68 degrees inside there. So that's instant weather report from Cumming, Georgia. It's windy here. We're expecting a rain. Today. And where are you, Chris? I'm in Athens, Georgia, right outside the Athens, Georgia. This is oh, gifted, by the way. This is not for the University of Georgia. This is gifted. <laughs> Home of the Bulldogs. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Jason, you went to UGA, right? I did. My diploma's hanging on the wall over here. I'd show it to you, but that ha that side of my office is messy. So <laughs> I'll leave that out. And I've got a picture behind my PC here of North Campus. And those not, not familiar with UGA, North Campus is the oldest part of campus. UGA was the first public college institution in the United States, started the whole public college model. So that, that, that part of campus is older than any other public institution in the United States for colleges. Yeah, you got to go walk around it right now. It's empty. So it's like a ghost town over there. I used to give tours. Uh, I was on the Georgia recruitment team, and, and every Tuesday, to get my public speaking up, <clears throat> obviously it worked because I can't shut up now, but uh, to get my public speaking up, I would meet people in front of the admissions building every Tuesday, whoever wanted to do the tour, and it could be new students or athletes looking, checking out the school, and I would give them a tour of North Campus. My daughter's actually going to be doing that, I think, next uh in winter semester that's great like that. yep pretty cool organization yep ray swanson where are you today in the world i'm just north of chicago i'm kind of in a little town called antioch illinois uh, we're right on the wisconsin illinois border it's a lovely 49 degrees out right now and raining i think we got about two inches of rain last night so and some more coming in here but uh Fred, we're all here. inside so it doesn't matter much Fred. sounds nice so as a reminder this is liquid wear unplugged mm -hmm. and a lot of times before the webinar starts which yeah. today is 15 minutes after the hour a lot of times we'll be in a green room and we have this mindless banter and, and talk and doing our sound checks but because we're liquid wear unplugged in this new format we're sharing all this with you. And I'd like to also introduce Mark Nelson and his buddy there. Say hi. <laughs> Where are you this morning, Mark, in the world? I'm in Lafayette. Oh. <laughs> I'm in Lafayette, New Jersey, up in Sussex County in the country. And nice. this is Fred. He's nine months old and 70 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my son. <laughs> How's he doing with the house training? Oh, he's great. He's doing really well. He's just very chill, but he's a big chewer. So I can call him Freddy the Destroyer. So you can tell we're all working from home this morning. Mine might look like a corporate office just because of that signage, but you can tell it's a home office, I believe. And uh, we're all, Liquid Wear started working from home. Really, in the uh, later part of March, maybe around the 21st, I can't remember when we, and some of us work from home anyway. A lot of this crowd that you see here uh, work from home a lot of the time. But uh, sharing that same sentiment with the rest of the world, everybody that can work from home has been working from home. Things optimistically starting to open back up. 
we hope everyone is doing really well out of this uh, COVID-19 thing. I know it, it affects people personally differently. You know, you, you may be some of the minority that have someone affected in your family and, and we feel for you and, and our thoughts, prayers are with you on that. Um, or you, you may be like the majority, you're affected in a different way and you're either shut down your family, shut down your kids or schooling from home, things like that. And uh, we feel for you too. But uh, I'll start to recap where where we were just as small talk for the work from home realization, you know, that it was going to uh, affect our business in, in, a, in, in one way or another and affect the world. Early in March, late in February, really, or uh, right around the 1st of March, we started having these internal discussions about, you know, what's going to, you know, what could happen with this whole coronavirus COVID thing. And we saw it, it increasingly in the news. And then that's when we realized that really quickly, Liquidware is in a position to help organizations as they send more and more users to work from home. And immediately we started getting some calls from our customers that uh, wanted to expand their virtual desktop environments to accommodate for more and more users. So this happened over the next few weeks. And, and a lot of, we were able to help in many ways uh, with uh, sending users from home, making sure they had best practices in place. Uh, and that is folder redirection set, as, uh, set up as a minimum, leveraging cloud storage areas, making sure that uh, if they expanded their virtual environments, whatever that may be, Citrix, Amazon, uh, VMware, WVD, the kicking the tires of that too, RDS, that uh, users would have a seamless experience to log on and, and move over. And we have been able to help several organizations through that. Uh, just a reality check again, as we've had several handfuls join us again, we are doing a soft launch of this beginning of this webinar this morning. We'll start at 15 minutes after the hour with a little bit more formal things, but this won't be a formal webinar today. This is going to be an open discussion. And this and, and why is that? That's because it's called Liquidware Unplugged. Yeah, Jason, that's a, that's a good point. Um, if you guys have questions for us, I mean, this is meant to be an interactive type event. Um, we ask that what you do is you post your question either via the Q&A window or the chat window. And as uh, those questions start to come in, we will elevate you and we will actually unmute you so you can have some dialogue back and forth with our experts as they talk about this. And we'll just kind of go back and forth with that. We'll kind of handle the muting and unmuting as it, as it goes on. So if you ask a question, um, we'll, we'll try to get to you everybody's questions in turn um, and, and kind of go through all of that. But um, this is meant to be interactive. So please do uh, pose your questions via the, the question and or uh, chat window and we will get to all of those. We we do also have a few um, questions that were submitted prior to the event through our, um, we have a brand new uh, email account for this. It's unplugged at liquidware.com. So as we do more of these sessions, if you have other questions that you want to ask ahead of time, maybe you weren't able to get there, you want to make sure that um, that question gets uh, addressed. We've got a few of those out there as well. So we'll be handling uh, a few of those as we move on here. I think also um, some of our experts and Jason might have uh, gotten some questions ahead of time from talking to people uh, about this event as well. So we'll do that. We also have a few polls um, that we might uh, launch here. Um, and we'll launch one of these here shortly after we begin the presentation. Um, nothing major, but just to kind of get a pulse of, of the group, see where we're at. And then at the end of the event, we'll do, uh, do another poll um, or two to kind of see how what you thought of the event. And uh, finally, we'll, uh, if you have any questions or comments for us, suggestions for other topics for other unplugged events like this, um, go ahead, email us at unplugged at liquidware.com. Uh, you can put them in the chat or the Q&A, however you want. Uh, it's all about feedback and this is about an event to give you guys some more interaction with our team. Jason and Ray, uh, Sonia just sent me a message. I want to know when the experts are actually going to show up. Uh, keep talking about the experts. Where, are they are they here yet? They're here. They're here. Cool. Today's experts are here. So Today's don't experts. don't be don't be so shy there, uh, Mr. Yeah. Walker and Mr. Nouse. So and Mr. Smith. So you guys, you guys are our experts for this panel, and uh, you guys have a lot of experience here. So don't uh, sell yourself short on those. 
Yeah, expert, expert. at uh, we're all an expert at something. That's the way. That's the way I'd answer that. Yeah. yeah, my my daughter might argue with that. <laughs> all right, so we're officially at the beginning of the session, um, and I'm going to go ahead and start us off with with a quick little poll for the people that are here, and I just want to ask everyone: Do you currently have work from home practices ongoing in your organization? So if you want to go ahead and um, we just launched that poll. So if you wanna go ahead and give us an answer, that'd be great. It's kind of get a, get a little pulse of what's going on here. We'll give it just a few more seconds for people to chime in. Uh, this is nothing scientific. We're, we promise that this won't uh, make its way into the news sources. It's just something that uh, we wanted to hear a little bit from you guys. So looks like we've got 70% of our people voted. If we can, it'd be great if we could get it up to 100, but uh, realistically, we'll give it maybe one more second here and see. Yeah. Right. yeah. So Chris with Walker, that, you can't vote. Yeah, Chris well, let Walker, me vote. your panelist, you're, you can't vote. I want the other button. Where's the other button? <laughs> <laughs> I figured this one was a simple yes, no. We're going to have fun today. I'm already having fun. That's, that's what it's all about. This is very uh, loosey-goosey, we'll call it, uh, as far as structure goes. All right, so we've got that. It looks like 95% of people um, do currently have uh, work from home in their environments, 5% no. Um, and we got, had about 80% voted, So and people are still coming in. So, um, you know, there's some things there. I see uh, Jane ha had a comment for us that she was happy that the dog barked. So yeah. that's pretty awesome. Um, we, we like all of our friends, uh, two legs or four legs, that you're welcome to comment uh, on this. Yeah. Um, so Jason, do you see any questions you wanna get us started with? Well, I'll do some quick introductions again, because many people joined us in the last bit. We'll make them brief, more brief this time. Uh, I am Jason E. Smith. Use that E because my name's so common. I'm head of uh, product marketing over here and uh, still can carry my end of a technical conversation most of the time. And this new format, I am really excited about too. As we said, we're going to have fun with it. This is different. We're going to take very much. It's going to be interactive throughout. Mark Naus. Oh, hello everyone. My name is Mark Now, Senior Director of uh, Alliances and System Integration. Uh, nice to meet all of you. Chris Walker, I'm a field, field SE uh, based out of Athens, Georgia. Um, I'm just here for lunch. They promised me lunch. It hadn't showed up yet. You were hearing. Keep from, waiting. <laughs> keep waiting, Chris. You were hearing from Ray Swanson. Ray, on recap. Yeah, I'm. I'm the director of marketing here at Liquidware. I'm uh, here to kind of keep things going and elevate and kind of help uh, Jason with elevating the questions and do some of the uh, man behind the curtain type things, even though I've got my webcam on so you can see behind the curtain, uh, giving you that special view. Um, please ask your questions via chat and or q and I know we have a few questions that came in offline through our email, which is unplugged at liquidware.com. Um, the, those were great for uh, ones that had come in earlier. Um, but if you have questions now live, please ask them, them via the Q&A and chat, and we will elevate you uh, to interact. Once you ask a question and we hand it off to an expert, we will actually unmute you so that you can interact and talk and have some dialogue with the experts as well. Um, so. With that being said, why don't we go ahead and get started with uh, one of these questions that came in offline. And um, someone had asked, how are the large hosting providers, um, I think they mentioned specifically AWS, Azure, and Google responding, and what's their load like? Well, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I'll field that one. So Microsoft uh, Azure alone has seen a 775% increase in uh, Azure activity. Wow. Yeah, so that's quite a bit. Um, at being in these environments daily, uh, you could feel you know, just things aren't uh, normal, right? Uh, latency, things like that. Uh, specifically the WVD though, I, I think it's a great opportunity for them to really uh, harden their gateways and improve their 
performance. So I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of positive uh, updates come out from them. Uh, even in the client, their WVD desktop client is being updated monthly uh, just with new features. So really enabling work from home. Uh, last bit, uh, ironically, with Google Cloud Platform uh, and, and all the platforms in general, is we've also seen an uptick in uh, RDP attacks. Uh, so uh, any folks out there using any of the three, uh, really make sure you close down your RDP ports and uh, you have to use some type of gateway. That's great advice. All right, man, for that question, for sure. <clears throat> We're seeing, you know, a lot of requests come in from all the vendors. They look like they've 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 been fielding uh, scale up requests. Chris Walker and I were out in Birmingham when this started breaking loose mid March, and <clears throat> just that room of people that we were in for the CUGC. Uh, they were discussing their projects. Every one of them had a project that was affected from work from home. Some of them were scaling up Amazon Workspaces environments. Another one was rolling out a brand new Citrix environment for a major hospital in the Birmingham area that's associated with the major university there. <clears throat> they had a Citrix environment for sure already, but this one was going to be a brand new net new Citrix environment for um, for their admin support, HR, accounting, and others. And he had realized that the quickest way to get this environment up was to host it on Azure. So he said, I'm not even considering anything on prem for this because I know this is going to be the quickest way up. And uh, he felt like, uh, you know, Chris raised his hand and told him about the latency he might expect uh, in there and, and tells users to expect. But this was a net new environment. He wasn't that concerned about it because the ease of setting it up in Azure, he believed, was going to outweigh any bit of latency that they would uh, incur. Now, the I, user got, um, I was talking to a customer, um, I think it was last week, and they said they had actually received an email from their provider, uh, you know, one of the three large ones, and uh, the provider was actually asking him to spin down or turn off his labs or any non-essential equipment. Um, have you guys heard things like that? I'm based to free up resources? Some of the data centers running kind of hot these days? Yep, that's an audience question, so feel free to chime in there if you've heard that. We are being asked by cloud providers to make sure you're streamlined and efficient so it helps them out, helps other customers out. Yep. Yeah, it's going up a lot of new environments in uh, Amazon and Azure and even Google over the past 30 days. People um, powering up machines like crazy to help their, their workers work from home. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, somebody, uh, Walter, has chimed in and said that he has heard that. He also has a question for you guys if you're ready for it. Um, he said, uh, we do a lot of Citrix work and we have seen remote PC be the go-to fastest way to move forward. Uh, also one of the cheapest compared to go to meeting. Do you guys want to talk about that for a minute and we'll uh, invite Mr. Scott to join us? Yes, please. So, oh, please, I, guys. I, I, yeah, how's it going? Uh, that that's something near and dear to me uh when i was uh in the enterprise uh, microsoft remote desktop connection was our number one citrix application uh it would either be used to connect to servers for development and administration or to our user population to their desktops and uh what better way to broker a user to a laptop or desktop that's in an office they have everything that they need uh, the picture of the cat is there, and all the icons are there where they want them. So. Right. I mean, for for us, it was we have a number of customers who I don't think you guys remember about three weeks ago or four weeks ago. I can't remember now when Zoom and GoToMeeting and and basically WebEx all went down at the same time because it got overloaded. Um, yeah. After yeah. that point, um, a lot of customers were like, "Well, what can we do to you know resolve that issue?" And you know, since we don't have and if they don't have infrastructure help, what's the fastest way of doing it? So. You know, a cloud service model with just a broker sitting in the cloud and a net scaler of the service, mm -hmm. then you've got remote PC already set up. And, and a lot of those customers that were doing like go to meeting, go to webinar, and things like that were looking at the pricing and they were seeing the pricing was actually very competitive for Citrix licensing, which I thought was kind of strange, but I didn't realize how much, how, how expensive actually that can be um, um, to provide that kind of solution. You're saying remote PC is actually cheaper? Yes, I am. Yep. Wow. That's nice. what that's what the customers are telling us. Yeah. Yeah, no. So, had a lot of customers doing that too, dropping a stratosphere agent on the physical desktops at the desk so I can actually monitor them as well, make sure they're getting a good experience. So, yep, 
I had a customer and, in Florida just just last week do that. They're uh, you know send all their workers home, and they don't have enough BDI infrastructure to actually bring the users online to so load remote PC to just let them control their desktop at their at their desk. Right. I mean, it, it takes a couple hours to set up. I mean, honestly, it, it, it's, even if you did an email with Citrix and they were able to get you a demo going, you literally only need to take a half a day to actually get everything up and going and get them working. So, um, you know, kudos for that kind of solution. The other thing, the auto scale option for Citrix Cloud, um, Citrix did put out an email to everybody uh, telling all customers to, to disable that um, really? and force force all your machines on and don't ha don't 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 basically power off machines if, if needed. Yeah. Huh. That was one of the challenges we had with that solution was uh, hibernation and things like that. So we would actually have a, a little tool to perform wake on LAN. And uh, we were surprised how many folks just started leaving their laptops in the office. And uh, wow, a laptop, pretty cool. It's got its own built-in UPS. So that's good too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Walter, thank you for that, and we can continue to talk. I don't, I'm not cutting you off at all, but I wanted to let uh, all the attendees know that this is exactly how we're encouraging this to work. Thanks for chiming in. <clears throat> so, if we, uh, while we're continuing to talk to Walter, think about if you would like to participate, submit a question, and R Ray Swanson can take you off mute, and we'll, we'll, we love this two-way interaction. So. Uh, and Think Jason, if I, were, while we're talking. if I recall, when we were, when we were in um, um, Birmingham, we talked to one of the Citrix reps, and he said his phone was ringing off the hook, and that was back yeah, in like, fact, February. He, he kept, yeah, he kept picking up, had text after text. It was just literally like licenses uh, being requested to expand. So Walter, what doing. Walter, are you? I mean, is it you spend a huge amount of time doing remote PC and Citrix work out there? Yeah, I mean, basically what we're, I mean, the biggest problems we were having with Citrix, um, two things came out of line. Everybody was asking for more license because no, nobody had enough licenses for it. Really just trying to get the license uh, bulked up so that they could support work from home strategies, as well as um, bandwidth for net remote access. Um, you know, a lot of people didn't plan, you know, plan for the snow day, effect, so, so to speak, so they couldn't support the workloads from working, uh, from working from home. So that was also another issue. Citrix went out of their way a little bit to kind of force a, force a, a purchase price, so they stopped allowing eval licensing for NetScaler. So you couldn't do the VPX 1000s anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to, so you had to go into sales and request it, and then they were only going to allow like 15 to 20 days for for eval licenses, and that had to, that had to be signed off by director. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was it, it becomes a bit of a you know, go back and forth, but they they kind of put a little pressure on themselves. But I mean, I understand what they're trying to do, but um, it, it's just the nature of the business, I guess. No, I thought I heard too that they were like um, they were selling like uh, what was it ninety day licenses or some like something like that to help people get through this you know a smaller like what like a year term or something like that is was that true or is that just some, a rumor I heard? Uh, they said so they always had the ninety day eval license for VPX one thousands and three thousands, uh, which you could always okay. uh, deploy in your environment and then you could, and basically you could just renew as many times as you want to. And previously they pulled that off their website so people couldn't do that because people were taking advantage of it. The other thing yeah. it does it immediately voids support for for support for Citrix. If you if you have an eval license running, you can't get support for it. So those are two things. That was their justification for pulling it off. Um, you do have the capabilities with, with Citrix to do um, bursting, uh, so you can buy bursting licensing to go um, up to a certain volume and then pull it back based off of the ne needs of the year. In this case, that makes good sense if you if, if you bought bursting licensing for that. Um, I don't see a lot of the bursting licensings. Uh, you'd have to be in more of a uh, more of a larger banking environment and other needs for 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 those kind of kind of situations like that that I typically don't see, but uh, I know they're out there. Yeah. I mean, I know last year a lot of people were looking at the cloud. Um, this year, I've seen a lot more people adopting and actually moving, especially because of the uh, um, COVID-19 work from home type stuff. It just has ballooned like crazy. As, as um, Mark was talking about those load numbers that the, uh, the providers are seeing. Is that what you're seeing with your customer? You're, you're in where are you at, Walter? Carolinas? Where we're in the Carolinas. Yeah, so we yeah, basically okay. cover the southeast, and we do have some customers up north in New York and places like that um, who've been hit a little harder than others. Um, down here, it's not; it's basically just uh, work from home and sunny and pretty, sort of my part. So, 70 degrees. So, um, yeah. I think thanks, Walter. Got, uh, snow up there, right? Ray still got snow up there. Ah, uh, we're rain right now. All the snow's melted off. I've even cut the grass once or twice. So oh, imagine wow. that. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Let's leave Walter on. Uh, Walter, you can use your own mute button if you wish, but we've got another question coming in from uh, Lance. And uh, Walter, feel free to chime back in if you'd like to. And uh, Lance, I see a question in here from you and, and thought maybe you want to ask it yourself. And uh, Ray, let, let him know. When you got him unmuted. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, long time uh, listener, first time caller. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I had to do that. Um, no, I, I kind of wanted to ask all of you, um, you know, from both your professional, technical kinds of experiences, I know we've, we've all been sort of in this um, remote desktop kind of game for a while, um, but do you think now is actually the time that this is really finally going to kick off? And do you think that uh, work from home will last beyond this crisis? And what do you think will happen next after this sort of experiment that we've sort of forced everybody into? Um, and what do you guys think? Do you think it's been successful so far? That's a great question. Uh, I, I hate to be the Nostradamus and say, yeah, this is the year of VDI finally, right? We've been saying that for almost a decade now. Uh, having work disaster recovery during 9-11, uh, you know, we all never thought that would happen. Uh, and I spent a good part of six months working in Jersey City, standing up uh, environments for financials. I was with Compaq at the time. And what I saw after that was, well, DR, BCP might have been, you know, number five strategic initiative, but it, it certainly shot up to CIO initiatives. Um, I, I would see, you know, probably VPN infrastructure being built up after this, uh, different ways for remote access, of course, desktop virtualization, cloud bursting. I could see these initiatives where they may have been like, you know, a lower on the uh, CIO priorities and, and long range plans. Uh, I could definitely see them uh, going up in, in uh, ranking. Uh, my wife works for a company called ADP and they're about 55,000 users. and. I've been surprised their uh, their VPN, although sometimes she has issues connecting, um, she's been productive. So uh, kudos to them for their planning on their VPN infrastructure. Yeah, I was listening to a talk show just the other day. I was you know, driving around in my truck in the south. I got nothing else to do but listen to your your radio, your AM radio. Um, and and they were talking about how this was going to going to come the the new norm. People are liking to work from home. They're they're actually being productive. Now, not everybody can do that because not, not everybody's uh, driven like that. Uh, I like working from home myself, but uh, they were talking about how people were enjoying that. They'd be there with their kids, feed the dog, um, go out for a walk at lunch. So I think the, um, you know, a lot of people are going to want to work from home as well as the companies are also realizing, hey, I don't need that office space, right? I don't have to pay for that office if That's all these people point. are home, I'm cutting my expenses. So right. the businesses are, are figuring out, you know, hey, this might actually be economically feasible. Even if I do have to buy all this extra equipment, I don't have to have a huge office for a thousand people. I just need one for fifty. And then come I, in I'm on just, my I know, but I'm just kind of worried about the pointy hairs and the way they always look at things. Like if they don't see butts in chairs, nobody's working. Right. And that's what I'm kind of, you know, that, how, how many pointy hair bosses are still out there? And well, there's a good point. Probably a bunch, Lance. But you know, one of the things that I've heard over the last couple of days, uh, my sister works for a very large financial provider. Uh, my wife works for a healthcare company that's that's a rather large one. And a lot of them have instituted these open concept seating arrangements and things like that. But as we continue to look at some of these regulations and things that they talk about social distancing and whatnot, those plans are are out the window and they're not going to be able to enforce those. So even in play, and they needed those to accommodate the number of workers in the office space that they had. So if mm -hmm. those plans continue on, they're going to have to be forced to adapt and change. And so uh, some some of these people, as, as I've talked to them, have said, hey, we, our team probably isn't going to be one of the last teams to go back into the office because we can be productive. We can work from home and go from there. So I think there, there, while, while what you say is true, I think there's going to be some level of forced adaptation based off of what's going on and what these outside sources are forcing them to. It yeah. brings up a, a great point, which is actually had that conversation a lot over the past couple months. Um, Stratosphere can actually monitor and knows if the user is actually interacting with that machine. So just because they're logged in doesn't mean they're actually using it. 
So we can actually uh, mm -hmm. session idle time, things like that. So a yep. lot of my customers, I mean, in the past, you know, people, they'd ask it maybe, I'd get a question once a month. Now it's every, every call because the managers want to know, are these people actually working? Are they watching Oprah? Yeah, um, I use it a lot just to determine health because I'll see something and I'll go, well, are they actually using that or are they not using, you know, that sure kind of thing. And it will, it will tell me exactly like what apps are up and running. It, Stratosphere yep. is very nice for that. Yep. show you well, a screenshot of one of our new reports here in a minute. Y'all keep talking. Yeah, I actually, um, we're testing 615 in beta right now. And I got contacted by uh, development last night because they wanted to know. I, they said, we think the agent's broken. This, we think the new agent's broken. Um, your sales guy in Florida, what is he doing? Because they, they said, we could see that he was on a WebEx meeting, but he's not looking at the WebEx. But I can actually tell what's in the foreground. And he was flipping back and forth. You know, don't want a normal sales guy. I'm talking on the WebEx, and he's doing his normal job. So they didn't understand how the, um, you know, how the actual workflow so Mark, you know, he's he's on the WebEx with me. We're doing the doing the demonstration, and he's checking email and all this other stuff. But they actually thought the agent was broke because it was showing so many different applications um, as in the foreground. So now we can actually in six one five, I can actually track the foreground application that you're you're viewing in the yeah. environment. That's pretty can cool. You, can you see my PowerPoint? Yep. We can. Yep. I'm going to go to. Uh... This new report, some of our data is being fed into Power BI here, so it looks a little different than Stratosphere, but we also have Stratosphere reports that are very similar to this, and let me raise this up here. Yeah, there you go. But here's a, here's a new report we're suggesting that um, our users check out and our, our data, and, and getting this into Power BI is easy enough, but you can also, as I said, get a lot of this through Stratosphere, but, you know, Stratosphere is telling you at a glance three things, the connectivity, operational, and the productivity of your users. And so you can see, and you can just about read this before I start talking about what it is, right? The, how many users mm -hmm. you have connected. Um, you can look at operational and start to get a, a really high level of, uh, of a, like a health check, as Walter's talking about. And then you can also see at a glance, how productive are they? That, and your rating there's pretty good I think at 66 percent considering people do take breaks they they eat lunch they do things like that we we're looking and we're encouraging more of a high level you know give us an idea that business productivity applications open and not so much of a nit nanny right because nobody really wants that uh, I don't think <laughs> in their organization but it gives you an idea of how productive users are and and this is some things that uh, you know the, the, the C level and others are going to want to see we just sent a bunch of people to work from home, and can you give me some kind of idea if they're working or not? And Stratosphere, as a reminder, can run in a VDI session, but it can also run, you know, if you own the hardware, you've got the right to put that on the hardware of, of your users as well, so you could see actually what's going on in those local machines at, at the same level. Yeah, I use you know, it on uh, local physicals as well. Right. I, I really like this report. Uh, I collaborated with the gentleman who came up with the uh, math for this. Uh, and this resonates heavily with me coming from a managed service provider with close to 50,000 seats under care for desktop virtualization. And, and in uh, any type of burst or uh, you know, crisis situation, you're inundated with things going on as a manager reporting up to executives, you know, managing down to your operational team. Uh, and these two things specifically resonate with me. Uh, can you connect? Uh, and what are the problems you're having connecting? And once you connect, can you work, right? Or what we, the classic one we hear is it's slow. So having a pulse on these two things are, are really crucial. And then lastly, uh, for me, uh, at the end of these type of events, there was always some type of post-mortem. And without a tool like uh, Stratosphere, I'd probably have to gather the information from four different sources. And then it's, it was just funny math. I was just kind of eyeballing it. But to have something like this to make your job easier so that after the event you can learn from it, it it's so important. And I, I, I just love this slide, uh, more importantly, this report, Jason. For sure. For sure. Um, looks like let's move on to the next question and, and we can leave Lance on again too. Uh, Lance, if you want to control your own mute button. Does that work, Ray? Yeah, that should we work. We can just, just add fine. to the discussion. Chris, uh, Chris DeFersiers 
is submitting a question. So let's think about taking Christopher off mute here. He's got a good question. Let him ask the question himself if uh, he'd like to. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. We can hear you loud and clear. Great. Morning, Thanks Chris. for awesome. Awesome. Uh, my question uh, simply was um, with you know with the initiative of going from to work from home, um, security is the is pretty much the name of the game here. Um, would this in fact impact users? Um, you know, are security analysts ready to you know to be able to educate users efficiently on how or you know best practices to you know when working from home as well? Um, you know, would this create a barrier where, you know, users are going to have to now be forced to use the best practices? It's no longer, you know, well, I, you know, I, I tape, you know, I write down all my passwords on the back of my keyboard. Well, you know, we can no longer afford to do that working from home. It's going to have to be, you're going to have to use the best practices, or, you know, what what kind of reprimands are in, in you know, are, are, or I guess what kind of consequences will be will be held if they're if they're not able to do that as well. Picking back to that. Um, would you all agree that that would probably increase the need for, you know, tech support services, uh, help desk support services? I think, I mean, it's going to increase it, but the, uh, I, mean, I was talking to a big customer yesterday and they were implementing, you know, bring your own device. The problem with that is they don't control the device and they've lent it into their VPN. So what they've done is they're using the IGEL, um, the UD, UD pocket. pocket. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the UD pocket. So they're basically telling, you know, they'll ship them a USB drive Say okay, you can use your own device, but you got to plug it in, in, plug it into your machine, and boot it up on this. That way, okay. nothing on that box can hurt me. Mm. So they're they're going going to some extreme things like that um, to protect their infrastructure. Um, and it's and you know, pocket. Pretty, if those are unfamiliar, yeah. that would boot you into the IGL Linux OS, and <clears throat> you, know, you may have to have an advanced user to change the boot order in the BIOS, but that's as simple as it is to get there. It's a great companion to a, a virtual desktop as well, because then you'd have a shortcut sitting there for Citrix. Open that up. You could actually use the browser with an iGel if you'd if you'd built that in for Firefox or something like that, and have a nice secure desktop with. Uh, and you, you could use not only the UD Pocket, but you can download that ISO from their website, and uh, give it a try too. And Stratosphere, by the way, there's an agent in there for Stratosphere to man to uh, monitor the Stratosphere UX to monitor the uh, Linux session itself and the endpoint. So we see the end to end to end. So we're a partner with IGEL in that regard. Yeah. Wow. But from a security perspective, um, Mark, you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. So um, Jason uh, highlighted one solution and that's to totally take the underlying operating system on the BYOD device out of the picture. Uh, replacing it with a secure hardened Linux uh, operating system with it simply a remote client, whether that's uh, Amazon, Workspaces, WVD, Citrix, they even support a few others. Um, however, you know, speaking on remote desktop technologies and, and sending that to a BYOD remote device, I think you need to follow the basics, right? Keep it simple. Um, be very careful with your redirection of local devices. Um, the, these are pathways for viruses and ransomware to come up through that device. Um, watch your USB redirection and devices for, you know, USB keys and things like that, uh, drives. Uh, also, and um, uh, pretty important is to ensure there's log off times and lock screen locks, just like you would on a laptop that also often gets forgotten. You know, the great thing about a remote session is if you get disconnected, you can simply reconnect and you're where you were. Uh, but so I think, you know, ensuring those basics are, are set, you know, definitely uh, do not, we said earlier, do, do not just open RDP uh, 3389. You'll see immediate attacks uh, specifically in the cloud environments. Uh, there's just a, a plethora of tools that are very simple to acquire. And just it, everybody knows the Azure AWS uh, IP blocks that they're using, and, and you can just see it open one up, open up Resource Monitor, and, and you'll see the foreign IPs trying to get at it. Uh, so secure those ports. I, I think you know overall migrating to a cloud or bursting in the cloud uh, gives you an opportunity to kind of do a zero trust model and implement security because all the tools are there, whereas you know on premise uh, they, they were a little disparate. 
So you know, my right recommendation with anybody venturing into this would be, you know, know the basics, right? Know, know the basic attack vectors and, and block those off. Some tools uh, like uh, VMware View, PC over IP for that matter, with regards to driver redirection, allow read and not write, which, which could help some users. So, thanks, Chris, for that uh, volley. Absolutely, thank you. Um, we'll ask um, Walter Scott and if he's still on, because yep. we've got a lot of customers that are spinning up, you know, thousands of machines, and they're sometimes, you know, as much as possible, they're trying to do their security best practices. But are people getting lax about that? You know, hey, I've got to break the rules to get my people up and running, so I'm gonna ignore this little very important thing on the side here. Walter, are you seeing things like that? Well, I think everybody's trying to achieve to, or trying to achieve something they never thought they had to do before, right? So, you know, this work home from you know, everybody work from home strategy is something they just didn't think of, you know, seven weeks ago. Um, so that idea of how do we accomplish this? How does my IT um, as a business unit, you know, cover this these work needs? I mean, from my perspective, a virtual desktop is a sandbox in itself where you can control everything going on with it, whether it's in the cloud or if it's on prem. You have a lot more control with that model than you do with the VPN solution. It's one of the classic arguments against VPN is extending the network out to an endpoint device that you don't manage. And a lot of times that is one of the worst things you can do because you're 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 taking ownership of that that hardware as well as that person is taking responsibility and liability in that situation. Where in a VDI desktop, you can lock things down a lot easier, whether it's you know. Uh, CUI compliancy or even just you know, typical lockdown of, of copy and paste and, and different things from, from remote redirection. The other thing, I think Login BSI a few weeks back did a couple of papers um, for capacity planning as well, where basically if you disable all those features uh, from the VDI, you can get a lot better performance and get more capacity in your in your remote connections. So there's there's some benefits for capacity as well as security-wise. I, so I think the VDI solution as a whole can be locked down specifically for making sure you, you can protect your data, as well as providing the user a consistent look and feel for, for business work uh, instead of trying to use their own PC and, and work from home. Doesn't Citrix actually have a product, I think it might be in the cloud, where they actually can detect anomalies and things like that as well? Uh, they do have like the analytics uh, built into the cloud yeah. service. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. yeah. So there, there's there's some overlap. Those technologies are becoming very important. I mean, I five years, six years ago, I would have used something called Veronis to actually mm -hmm. do a lot of what you're, what you're talking about. And Veronis yep. is a great product. problem with Veronis is it's very expensive and it's very complicated. Um, so as these tools and these solutions start to, to be more commoditized, just like what your solution is working towards with what your stratosphere and the reporting that you're providing, because that's what you're really looking for. You're looking to see, you need to get a touch on the person and how they're behaving, their behavior, their, you know, what, what are they doing with, with their work, work style? And it's not so much what, what all they're doing, but are they consistently doing the same thing? Or are they doing something different, right? Um, yeah. And that's kind of like a lot of the analytics that you're seeing now with um, with Citrix and moving in that place. I mean, those are, that was the one big thing, and up to up to the point from work from home strategy become a priority for Citrix. It was really the development of the micro apps was where the next phase of where they're going. Yep. Let me go back and talk to um, something, Chris, to expand on what Chris had uh, asked about. Is do we do we foresee this continuing on for a while and as a, as a strategy? And we really do. We we think this might be a disruptor to uh, the commercial real estate market too, and you know, probably not a good thing for them. So they'll have to think about ways because I, I believe that um, now more than ever that uh, it will be proven people can be quite effective and work from home. So people will start to rethink office space, especially if the economy has any uh, downturn like uh, they're talking about. And when leases come up for renewal, people will be thinking about. You know, let's keep the workforce, but let's cut our uh, operational expenses by sending them sending them home to do that. And so we believe this traction. And there's a myriad of ways to work from home, right? Uh, we talked about it in some recent webinars, but you know, opening up a VPN to just get files is one way. You know, rely on Google Docs and things like that, uh, such as Microsoft Office, is a, is another thing to add to it. But then the most seamless way to go about this, arguably, is still to give them an official Windows desktop that they can call their corporate desktop and VDI, we believe will not just VDI, but anything RDS, VDI oriented, WVD will see growth uh, beyond this as companies will want to maintain some system, and not only for, um, you know, we, we've seen that for security in the past. It, it got emphasis in budgets, but we believe that work from home strategies will also keep a solid 
footing for budgets going forward in years ahead. Burst scale, the ability to burst scale and things like that at a minimum will be will be uh, in need. I think the company's going to figure out how cost effective it is not to have all that real estate sitting around. Mm -hmm. so. Flex offices may you know be in vogue, yeah. come in a couple yeah. days a week, and uh, Citrix has a really nice one. I was on their campus uh, a couple years ago, and we met in one of those areas. It was like you'd step into this. Their flex office there to describe it looked like a restaurant with uh, with with no food being served. <laughs> there was a snack yeah. bar around the corner and stuff. This is, you had booths there, and they had meeting tables and things like this. Those types of offices, many of you have seen those at other places, but those types of settings will become more prevalent, I believe, for shared office spaces and hot desking, things like that, to be able to sit down at a desk when you do come into the office. Yeah, but think about how you know, like gas has gotten cheaper. I'm sure water is going to come down because people don't take showers anymore. Um, you know, all of the, the essentials are getting uh, going to get cheaper just because, well, you know, yeah. I'm not going to tell you the last time I had a shower, but you can probably well, or yeah. Of course, a lot of people so. are probably wondering if I'm even wearing pants, so I'll just prove that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jason. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Liquid wear on the glad, glad you're. Uh, I mean, we have some good questions from the from the audience. Anything Anything else? I see uh, something from Chauncey Smith that said "smart check." That's all it said. So if uh, any panelist knows what he meant by that out of the previous discussions, chime in or we can uh, ask him for more details. We'd love to have you participate. Let's, uh, let's yeah. invite Chauncey to, to add in here. So you're unmuted, Chauncey, if you want to. Okay, that, yeah, that was, that was a comment made about the, uh, the Centric Analytics tool you were talking about, remote tool. Uh, oh, I believe yeah. Smart Check. So that's what that was. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the Smart Checks for the Citrix product. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like Chauncey's working from home. We yep. heard Bob okay. working earlier, and we love all that. That that's the unplugged nature of today. So, yep. Ray said he might we might hear a violin here in the country. You just don't want to hear a banjo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, concert's over. So I guess Chris my lives about forty five minutes from where uh, that movie was filmed. Yep. So, what's what's the movie night. thinking of? Deliverance. Deliverance. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Duke, Dukes of Hazard was filmed down here. Yeah, we got a lot of good classics. You guys are probably too young to remember the Dukes of Hazard, though. Oh, no Gee. way, Boss Hog. <laughs> <laughs> Daisy I think Dukes. it was my fifth birthday cake was a was a Dukes of Hazard birthday cake. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. I mean, what mm. other what other five year old doesn't like Daisy Duke, right? Yeah, well, yeah. That's Daisy Duke. Yep. And that that charger is you know famous. Yeah. Yep. We, you know, we've seen some uptick in Amazon Workspaces and AppStream. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask that. Yeah. You, we've, we, so we, I went through, Mark, if you've got your demo environment up for AppStream or something like that, you don't have to give ah, the whole, sure the whole tool, yeah. but I would love to show that because we've seen, and so first off, let me say Liquidware is Switzerland. We value our partnerships with Citric for VMware, uh, Microsoft, uh, and Amazon, Nutanix, all of them. We help the customer go to what they decide, right? And, but we've seen some organizations decide to burst scale on Amazon Workspaces and AppStream. And so the challenge comes in there, and Mark, correct me if I say this the wrong way, but uh, it, it seems like a very solid platform, Amazon Workspaces and AppStream, but the devil's in the details of getting your apps out there and image management continues to be a little laborious. So we can dramatically speed that up with FlexApp attach the applications from a VHD from object-based storage. Mark's got this phenomenal demo here. I hope I teed that up right. Yeah, thanks, Jason. So uh, I think this is pretty cool because if you, you Google some of the more Amazon uh, AWS EUC products, uh, there, there's not a lot of guys blogging. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we growing up in that world, we were so Citrix and RDS focused. Uh, so it's it's fun to see different things uh and as jason said uh we have a little fun demo here with the uh appstream product uh a lot of our customers will say okay you know we we want to adapt to appstream but we want to have a, a very uh dynamic uh application assignment we, we want to build essentially a factory 
uh, and we want to get to a zero cost image uh, and our product flex app allows them to do that uh, so i've got three things on the screen here uh, on my left uh, is, with the little factory icon is what we call our liquidware flex app packaging stack uh, and, and stack is a term in appstream and then on the right i have what an end user would see so uh, th this demo kind of tells a story how we go from uh, packaging an app to assigning an app to consuming an app. So with, with three different humans, uh, one, a, a packager who could be a contractor, uh, a, an outsourced entity, uh, and then a uh, profile unity EUC manager or admin, and then actually the end user. So, you know, just real quickly, I'm in uh, what's called the AppStream Windows uh, client, and I'm showing the native application mode. Uh, and a few folks who might not have seen this, it's kind of cool. It's, it's a seamless window, like we used to say in, in the Citrix world. Uh, and part of my manual keyboard here. And I will log in to the WhatsApp packaging console. Okay, just to give a quick overview, I don't know if. Uh, you folks have seen this, but our Flex App Packaging Console, or FPC for short, is really easy. Even if you're not familiar with packaging, you know, back in the old day, Wise Packager, uh, even, you know, SCCM packaging, MSI packaging, this is so simple, even I can do it. Uh, so what we love about this packaging fleet is it's in the cloud, it is ephemeral, uh, and that's one thing about a packaging environment, you know, you want to have good packaging hygiene. Uh, and a lot of folks will use VMO Workstation or Hyper-V locally and that use snapshots, but here you don't have to. So you can simply deploy a FlexApp packaging fleet in the cloud, a user can log in and you can lock down this environment to only the installers they need and only the locations they can save them. Um, I don't know if I have any installers ready to go. Uh, let me see, do I have any downloads? No. Um, I will leave that here, but that's pretty easy to do. And I'm perhaps during the, uh, the last It's as simple as uh, yeah, pointing to it and it starts installing and it's real, we call it fast packaging because it's just about as it fast as fast. install. <laughs> so here I'm a user and I have a zero cost image uh, and I'll show that in the Amazon console. Um, so this is the image I'm in here, okay. And within the Amazon AppStream, you assign uh, applications. So as you can see, I've got Windows Explorer and this little uh, tool or uh, gizmo that's going to refresh our applications. Uh, so that looks exactly like this screen, right? Two icons, same color. So that is all that is installed in that image, okay? Very simple to manage. You manage the OS, not the applications like we would in a baked image. So now I'm going to come in here to our Flex app or our Profile Unity console, and I'm just going to enable some stuff. Let's see, Flex it Reader, and it's all it is is a simple update to our uh, management policy. Activate the apps. Yep. And I'll come back to my console, and within about 10 seconds. Depending on where the flex apps are being delivered, these are all being delivered from the cloud. They'll start popping up to the end user. Love it, love it. So you just took a base image for Amazon, and and that could be, you know, take a lot of time to get Amazon to update the base image, right? Am I wrong in saying that still? Uh, the base image is pretty easy. It's just like we would do with any other reference image. Uh, but, you know, image management is an art. You, you optimize your image, you install all your agents. But uh, you didn't you, have to touch the image to do what you just did. No, I, all, I, all I did was dynamically assign an app, and that's yeah. the power. We have our app factory with all our flex apps here, and I simply drag and drop. Uh, now, if an application didn't exist, well, that's where we might have to engage our, our packaging team and, you know, put in a change management request and say, hey, can you get this package for us, you know, pretty quick. And, you know, I'm sure if you have a packaging team or, like I said, an outsourced company, you have SLAs around that, that would immediately, once that went through a UAT process, that would show up in our inventory. And then it's a drag and drop and then a, a login or a refresh. Um, you know, just for the heck of it, let's let's add some more. Let's see uh, how many we can add. So Wait, you, right you, you did this demo the other day for a long time. 
Citrix community person and their jaw dropped, I heard. Yeah, because it, it has a feeling very reminiscent to program neighborhood where you would just right click and refresh and all of a sudden your apps show up. So um, that's, you know, that, that, that's why a lot of people, so here they come. Uh, and I add probably about 10 applications. So I like to push the envelope a bit. Yeah, we'll and these are hosted and these apps are hosted where so i'll show you uh we have a selection of apps if you were to download our appliance we call them cloud apps and you can see this little liquid where icon it says liquid where app those are in s3 in amazon s3 those are I ones we packaged that those are ones we packaged for you yep. thing right yeah I have some that are on a file share in Amazon uh, on a storage uh, service called FSX. I have some that are on a file server. I even have some that are on Azure <laughs> uh, coming across a VPN and I have a couple that are on premises. So I'm pulling them from everywhere in the world and all different locations. That's why there's duplicates. Uh, one is coming from Google, the other one's coming from uh, Amazon. So. Now, what if the what if the image changes and you go to a different another OS version? Not, not a problem. Our our flex, our ease of, of packaging and our compatibility rates are so high. Uh, you just keep keep the application assignments the same and update the image. Hey, Mark, um, what does that look like in um, uh, Azure with uh, Windows Virtual Desktop? I was kind of wondering uh, how big can you do Flex App? in there and what are some of the limitations? So it's very similar in, in WVD Azure. Uh, this is what we're looking at now. So you can see the applications. Uh, it, it has less of a dynamic nature um, than what I showed here in the AWS AppStream product. And it's important to note that you know, Liquidware invested a lot of time with Amazon. And, and this feature and functionality I showed is known as a dynamic application provider for AppStream, and we work together with Amazon to deploy that. Uh, we haven't done that integration yet, but we plan to, uh, we hope, with uh, WVD, but it looks quite similar. Here's our liquid our corporate applications, uh, and I haven't pre-booted anything, so let's see how fast they were on, <laughs> uh, or pre-logged into them, but it's, it's the same premise where you would dynamically assign an application. I'll actually go and show that in our portal where I have it. Oh, not bad. That was pretty fast. Um, so I'll show the configuration I have for WVD. And that would be remote apps on startup right here. And you can see all these applications that I have, right? And then here's a few more. And then uh, here's the last. These bit. are the same exact apps working in both. They were packaged once. Package once and they're working in two different environments. This is like, this is when I, when I talk about our solutions, they run at a different level. They're not siloed in your stack. You know, you hear about what's this compete with? Well, some app layering from Citrix or some app layering from VMware or this or that. It's, those are all one thin ones. We're going across anything here. So you've truly decoupled apps. We do the same for profiles and we monitor that user experience. You can burst scale a different environment and have a user log in and the apps already be in there and you don't have to manage and 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 uh, reinstall and all that. Yeah, I could go across any of these environments. This is WVD applications, the same exact applications I showed in the AppStream demo. I have desktops here, one with FS Logics and one without in the Liquidware desktop. Uh, and I'm going to get the same apps, the same user experience, and I can also log in uh, to an Amazon workspace over here, and I'll show you the same experience, the same desktop wallpaper, the same icons, the same office activation, the same command prompt text color that I love, which would be yellow font and black background. So uh, yeah, it's it's pretty fun stuff uh, enabling to you to roam. Uh, but also, you know, that's kind of geeking out a little bit, but you know, let's simplify it and just say we're going to do a migration from either one VDI product to another or perhaps an on-premise environment. And, and that's where you know our sweet spot lies there with uh, profile unity and portability. Another question here. Um, what if I packaged some apps three years ago and I was an early FlexApp customer Can I and I used them under Windows 7? Could I use them today? You sure can. Yep. If they will run under Windows 10, that's the trick. Right. So. Right. So we don't do any magic with the applications as far as making them, you know, a Windows 7 application run on Windows 10 or something like that. 
but I do have a demo where of, I've packaged some applications, Firefox and Google Chrome, you know, back when FlexApp first came out, they will still mount. It is highly recommended that you go and repackage them every once in a while because we do upgrade our packaging technology, clean up the images, things like that, though. But your packages will probably still run. And thanks to uh, attendee named Tom for that question. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so as I go through some of these apps, I'm also demonstrating our flexibility, hence the name FlexApp, uh, with, with our ability to do three poignant things, have applications delivered on startup, have applications dynamically delivered at login, and then our click to layer feature, which I just demonstrated with Opera and OpenOffice. Uh, and what that did is it showed the icon, but the actual Flex app was not available to the user until I clicked the button. And that has many advantages. Perhaps this is an application that isn't often used. So why do you want to attach it and have it available? But the user needs to have that confidence to see that icon, because as we know, you know, if the icons are missing, that could be a help desk ticket. So I, I love the and once, once one user's uh, launched it, if it's in a shared environment like AppStream, it, the other users will it'll be instantaneous for, right? Yeah, exactly. Once it's once it's up, it just launches. Same for Citrix Zen app and others. Yeah. I've got I got one customer's actually packaged his virus protection. Um, <laughs> not rec not recommended. It's a very specific use case. It's a very is a it's a school system in the Carolinas. And they teach a hacking class. So uh -huh. when you know th these machines are, um, they're they're using um, what is it? Deep freeze. So right. when they boot that machine up, they'll walk in there at 11 o'clock, <clears throat> boot the machine up. That's time period set. The antivirus will not come down on the machine. But that's the only good use case I've ever found for for doing the uh, the antivirus. So one of you know big saying I have: just because you can does not mean you should. Yeah. So be be smart with your packaging. It's a tool to use in your belt. Um, do not, um, you know, like everybody wants to package Office. Why? Well, because I can. No. So you know, be be smart about that. Um, most time, Office should be in the base image. You update the base image, it updates Office. We do have several use cases where customers have packaged it, uh, like a large um, trading company. So he can actually package the applications. Um, Users log in, he's got four different versions of Office, some need professional. So based on the group they're in, I mean, his VDI image is just Windows 10, nothing else on it. So based <laughs> on the group, based on the group that he, you know, that user logs in, he may get off of Office Professional, Office Professional plus Visio. So that's a very good use case, but you know, requires a little overhead to manage. Just because you can doesn't mean you doesn't should. Doesn't mean you should. Yep. Uh, Tom added to this part question, part statement. He said, so I guess it doesn't matter how I deliver Windows anymore if I'm using this to deliver my apps. They'll follow the user. Um, yeah, that's correct. You, yeah. you have your base ISO, you develop your best practices, uh, how you manage your uh, Windows OS, updating, etc. Uh, now I would just add some advice. So don't apply your same uh, physical desktop updating and methodologies to BDI or cloud. You definitely want to stage things. Um, and that's regardless of the image or the, the live machines. Uh, but with the flexibility uh, with FlexApp, you, you build that image, you have your best practices, and you can automate this. That's when automation becomes very easy. The simpler the process is, the better the automation will be. Uh, a complex process automated is still complex. So uh, just having the OS automated, you can, uh, we, we know environments, uh, Chris mentioned a financial institution that tear things down every month how easy it is just to worry about tearing down your OS versus a complete baked image. That's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Even automated, it's a lot of work. And a lot of things could go wrong. That's great. So um, um, real quick, James, I'm going to package yeah, a notepad plus, plus, plus up in S3. Okay, uh, great. And let's see, let's see how it goes while you're wrapping up there. Got an executable then, yep. Good and Notepad plus plus. It's a small one, but it's quick to do. So that's why we're demoing it today. The uh, we're coming up on the hour, but people have stayed on. So we're going to keep showing a little bit more demo here. But I'd like any final thoughts to be put in the chat window if you want to ask any questions. Ray, you want to round that statement out in any way? Yeah, sure. Thanks for everybody that did answer a question. Um, you know, for people that did 
comment or come on and ask a question or a comment, uh, watch your uh, email. We're going to try to get your uh, mailing address and we're going to get you one of these lovely flex app and chill uh, official work from home t-shirts sent out to you. So we'll get your shirt size and go from there. Uh, while Mark is doing that, I'm going to ask uh, one or two little wrap up polls here and uh, just kind of gauge what you guys thought on this. Um, did you guys feel this the session was beneficial for you? And we'll just ask that real quick. Give it give it a few seconds for it to chime in here, and then we'll get right back to Mark um, with his demo. Um, we're sitting at 53%. See if we can get a few more. I really um, love this uh, format uh, as, as the, the votes are coming in, but I, I'm I like this format because I didn't have to prepare a PowerPoint for the first time ever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Jason, and you're going to want to do this for every uh, webinar from now on, huh? Yeah. And, I, and, and the audience didn't have to suffer through PowerPoint. Um, yeah. But, you know, we do demos too in, in our regular webinars, and they are very well attended. If this is your first webinar, we'd love to have you on one of those too. But uh, this may change up. And uh, I think I, I've enjoyed doing this so far. The race. Or Mark is packaging that application, and customers always ask, hey, that's a simple app. You know, everybody can do that. So, you know, just heads up, my largest application is um, 18 gig, 300,000 registry settings. The Epic like EMR app. Yeah, yeah. So we have done some big apps. There's even a recipe on our community site for packaging AutoCAD. So we have packaged some large apps. Mark's just showing you this small one just for the sake of time. Like anybody can do that. I hear my yeah. daughter saying that. I see the I see the response in for the vote, Ray. You want to share it with them? Yeah, 100 percent people said it was great, and we actually closed it off, so I wasn't uh, hogging up Mark's time with his demo. And a few people uh, couldn't uh, vote as well, but they chimed in that they loved this. So that's great. We'll we'll uh, look for further sessions of this coming up. Um, kind of going back to the, the one PowerPoint slide that we did have, which was just kind of informational. Um, if you have questions that you would like us to address in future sessions, please email us at unplugged at liquidware.com. If you wanna, um, uh, other ways to interact with some of us and some of our experts is go over to community.liquidware.com. We've got uh, a great community forum set up to interact with other users, with our experts, and talk about some of the things that you're seeing um, and different uh, topics that you have burning questions about. And we can uh, address those there. That's another great way to take some of this interaction offline. Um, we saw I guess that, that would be taking it online because that's going to a website. But that was um, a great demo. We saw we saw a Notepad come in. That was great. Yeah. So um, with that being said, look for another one of these sessions. We'll round one up probably in May. Um, and we have one last question for you. And I'm guessing I know how this goes based off of the last um, the last one. But we just want to ask: Would you attend another unplugged session with us? I have a pretty good answer indication compared to the last one. It won't let me click no. So <laughs> while you're voting, you've already voted. We love shout outs on Twitter because, of course, it shares the word of what Liquidware is doing. So if you found this valuable today, we'd love it if you gave us a quick shout out if you're on Twitter and said, hey, I just attended the first Liquidware Unplugged session and it was it was phenomenal. And I know you feel that way because you gave us 100 percent on both these polls. So. Uh, we're still yeah. getting some the current ones. And the books. even from people that can't, um, that can't. Be, be safe. Ahead. Be safe out there. Yeah, and if you are tweeting out there, use hashtag Liquidware Unplugged. Yep. So uh, we yep. appreciate we appreciate uh, our experts, Mark, Chris, and Jason, for joining us today. We appreciate everybody who chimed in uh, with questions, comments, uh, whether you were live on today's session or you had. Um, messaged us ahead of time through the email address. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, we hope everyone uh, continues to stay strong and healthy out there uh, in these times. And if you have questions or comments, please feel free to interact with us uh, on the community, through our website, through email. Um, we'd love to hear from you and we, we're here to help you guys out as, as you run into questions, snags, things like that. So anything else guys? I echo those sentiments. Those are great ones. Thanks, Ray. Yep. This is fun. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great day and uh, enjoy. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.